Shabbat Shalom. So, welcome. Uh, let's just go into it. Psalm 50, please. Now, well, normally I say something first, but everything that I want to say is going to come in a little while. Theoretically. <laughs> So we are in the middle of the fall feasts, uh, just coming off Yom Kippur, and uh, yesterday was a tough day to be pressing in and Be, be trying so hard to hear from the Lord yesterday. I, I don't know if it was that way for you, but for me it was very difficult. I did not hear from Him yesterday. And I just kept waiting from the Lord. And uh, I read. We laid around listening to worship music. We're, we're skinny little runts. We, we don't eat for a few hours and we just kind of go into a torpor state. <laughs> so we're like hummingbirds. We eat a lot and we move quickly. Uh, <laughs> but it was a beautiful day. Not because of the weather. Uh, in fact, Yom Kippur, one of my favorite memories of Yom Kippur was a few years ago when it was the coldest day that part of that of the year that yet and it was only in the low 40s and it was raining and it was kind of a miserable day out we were in the house and we were just listening to worship music and praising God the whole time and uh, our family broke the fast and, and sat together and just enjoyed each other uh, it was a real blessing and this morning I heard from the Lord and I hope and pray that these holy days you are taking advantage of it and that you are doing what God commands you to be doing these, this time of year. If you're not doing it, you are missing an incredible blessing. So, Psalm 50. A Psalm of Asaph. The Mighty One, God, Adonai, is speaking, summoning the world from east to west. Uh, I told you that this would be a night tonight talking about the Yom Kippur that is to come. And uh, in Yom Kippur, you know, we, we tend to think of it as your, 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 your name is either getting inscribed in the book or it's not. Or we tend to think of it, in, well, we tend to think of it in those terms. As Messianic believers, we say our name is inscribed. Lord, please have mercy on our brothers and sisters. But historically, it was always taught that Yom Kippur was the day God judged. Uh, and you go back in history and some pretty awesome events have happened on Yom Kippur. And I'm not just talking about the Yom Kippur War. That was a sneak attack. That was, that was Satan coming in and attacking from the rear. And, and look how that turned out. 
No, I'm talking about other other events. And it'd be it'd be worth your while to do a little study and see some of these things that have happened on Yom Kippur. Uh, it's a day of separation. Yes, that that concept of your name either being written in the book or blotted out from the book. That's separation. That's judgment. So when he says, the mighty one, God, Adonai, is speaking, summoning the world from east to west. Do you think, you know, when Moses called everybody that was wanting to rebel, when he called them up to the front of the camp, not everybody came, did they? No. You had the guys that hung back by their tents and the ground swallowed them up. And he was the man. In fact, God even says, the man, Moshe. But let me read that again. The mighty one, God, Adonai, is speaking, summoning the world from the east to the west. Do you think they're all going to show up? You better believe it. Because my Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is the Messiah. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God is shining forth. Uh, I've always heard it taught that God's speaking of Himself here as the perfection of beauty, and He is. But if we pay attention to basic grammar, <laughs> Zion is the perfection of beauty. Why is that? Because right now, you look at Jerusalem, she's pretty scarred up, isn't she? She's pretty divided up, isn't she? As beautiful as it is, it's lacking, isn't it? You, you, were, you were there most recently. It's pretty lacking. But guys, this is something Jerusalem is kind of like you, in a sense. I mean, look at us. We're, we're nothing really to look at. You are. But I'm married to you. <laughs> we're nothing special. Uh, my sins... I, I was... I was talking to a doctor today, and, and the doctor says, "Are you are you grieving, Mr. Wolf?" And I said, "Yeah, just grieving. This is just after Yom Kippur. Of course, I'm grieving. I'm I'm grieving my sins. Uh, we're we're beat up. We're scarred spiritually. We're just rubble piled on top of rubble, which is Jerusalem, right?" But what happened here? This happens after Messiah's foot touches down on the Mount of Olives. This happens after the king returns. So what is it? The king has gone into the city. He has established his kingdom forever. Which means Jerusalem has been redeemed from mankind. Re Jerusalem has been redeemed from all of the sin of mankind, Jerusalem has now been redeemed to be that city that fulfills the very purpose that she was created for. That's why he says, Jerusalem, Zion, is the perfection of beauty. Because when something that was once totally degraded and parceled up and divvied up and inhabited by the enemy and by the way do you know what gate the enemy was kicked out of in the six day war the Syrians were kicked out through the dung gate they snuck out in the night 
that wasn't just an accident. That was God. When God redeems you and cleanses you and puts His Holy Spirit in you, what does that make you? In God's sight, it makes you righteous. It makes you the perfection of beauty. Which is why he's so crazy about his bride. I mean, I, I look at myself, I, I look at the body of Messiah, and I think, what in the world? Why would he be interested at all? I mean, Yom Kippur, just yesterday, I'm pouring my heart out to God for all these days. Today comes, and my mind's wandering to places it shouldn't go. And, and I think, God, why would you? Why would you even care? And then he says, do you not know? Have you not heard that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Mo, I cleansed you from all unrighteousness. I put my Holy Spirit in you. You're beautiful. Wow. The lover of my soul? Whispering into my soul how beautiful I am in his eyes? I don't know about you, but that's mind-blowing. And he thinks Zion is the perfection of beauty when he is there and God is shining forth. Our God is coming and not staying silent. I mean, Catherine the Great, when she was coming, making her, her visit through the, the countryside, made no hill of beans. She was silent. In fact, they did everything they could to make it look like the peasants were happy and clean and had all their teeth and everything else. They Didn't they go so far as to build entire towns that were clean and fresh and then she went through, her carriage went through, they tear it all down and race ahead to the next place. No. No. Our God's not coming like that. Our God's not coming just to lay eyes on the place and say, yep, yep, okay, pretty good, see you later. He's not coming through here like a Biden motorcade. Our God is coming, and it says He is not going to stay silent. What does that mean? That means that the wicked are doomed. That means that those people that are sowing strife and hatred and are violent against God's people and His Word, that means that they're going to have to face His Word when He condemns them and cuts them down. It says that Yeshua will be coming back and there will be fire in His eyes a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes. Well, we've already been told that the Word is a sword. The Word of God is a sword. Maybe, just maybe, and I'm just spitballing here, but maybe he will be speaking the commandments of his Father as he goes in and slaughters them with the guilt and the condemnation that's required by the commandments of God when you reject the sacrifices. Maybe. With a fire devouring ahead of him and a great storm raging around him, he calls to the heavens above and to the earth in order to judge his people. What an awesome sight with fire devouring ahead of him, great storm raging around him. We can't fathom that. Why does he call on heaven above and the earth below to judge the people? 
witnesses. You have to have two witnesses, a minimum. Do you remember way back in Deuteronomy? He says, through Moshe, I call on heaven and earth today to stand witness against you. And now it comes full circle. My goodness. Gather to me, my faithful, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Guys, prior to Messiah, the sacrifices would be done in faith. People would be obeying in faith, offering the blood of these bulls and goats and rams. Now, the temple's gone away. There's no way for us to offer the blood of bulls and goats and rams. We don't need them because Messiah Himself, our High Priest, was also the sacrifice. And He rose again. And people with very hard hearts will say, I don't want any part of a human sacrifice. No, no, no. It's not a human sacrifice. It's called, you and me, we murdered him. No, 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 that was the Jews. No, no, no. The Jews handed him over. It was the Romans that did the actual killing. Well, I don't think so. Read your scriptures, please. Would you please just open the book? Quit watching the History Channel. You cannot get theology from the History Channel. You can't get much of anything from them. Not even history. Open your Bible and read it. You are accountable because you had access to it. If you are not studying the Word of God and you are on your face before the King of Kings and he says, why didn't you obey me? Well, I didn't know. You had the book. You had the book. And what's more, he wrote it on your heart. If you belong to him. You know. You know what's expected of you. To love justice. To do mercy. And to walk humbly. What's justice? How do we know what justice is? Justice is explained in the first five books. How do we know what mercy is? Mercy is explained in the first five books. And it's demonstrated in the Gospel. How do we know how to walk humbly? It tells you in the first five books. And then it demonstrates it in the Gospels. You have no excuse. The heavens proclaim His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. Now, who do you think this is speaking of? God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? God the Son. Because Yeshua said, the Father has made me the judge. So here's Yeshua right here in the psalm. He's not some... You know, they've got some wacko cult leader in Eastern Europe who claims to be Yeshua. And he's dressed up in his little outfit and he's got his, his hair like you'd see in the Byzantine paintings. And he walks around. No, no, no. Yeshua? When he summons, you go. He's got a fire devouring ahead of him and great storm raging around him. And he says, I will be the judge. That's, that's totally different from what you're going to hear Sunday morning. Sunday morning you're going to hear about how God is love to the exclusion that he's going to overlook your sins. No. What I read is he says, be sure your sins will find you out. 
What I read is, repent because the window's closing and then judgment's going to fall. Within this window that He gives you of His grace between now and the great Yom Kippur, we have that ability to repent. But once Yom Kippur hits, there's no more repentance. You will be smacked in the face with the reality of who He is and who you are and how much you've detested Him and how much you detest Him now. And everything in you will hate Him as He condemns you to hell. All that filth and rage and rebellion and hate in your heart that you have been hiding so cleverly is going to come to the surface. And he's going to say, away from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. Wow. Listen, my people, I'm speaking. Israel, I am testifying against you. I, God, your God, Wow. That terrifies me. If this isn't frightening to you, when we read him making a statement like that, something's wrong with you. Something's lacking. And you better get it right before the Lord. You better say, Father, what is it that's in me that has me so numb to your word? Please get it out. I want to be tender to your word. But let me warn you, usually when there's scar tissue built up, in order to get rid of that scar tissue, in order to make it so that you can feel again, you've got to debride the wound. You've got to rip all that off. It's going to be painful because you're going to see your sin. But praise God. Praise God. He disciplines those whom He loves. Are you going to pay attention? I am not rebuking you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are always before me. Guys, those burnt offerings that we give Him, that, that living our lives as living sacrifices, He doesn't miss a thing. He doesn't miss a minute of it. He's aware of everything. You don't have to keep track. Remember the goats and the sheep? The sheep had the goats had all that they were doing itemized. And they said, well, what about this, Lord, and this, and this, and this? We were casting out demons in your name. Woo! And he still said, but I never knew you. I never had anything. I have no need for a bull from your farm or male goats from your pens, for all forest creatures are mine already, as are the animals on a thousand hills. I know all the birds in the mountains. Whatever moves in the field is mine. A little mouse scurrying around, the coyote jumping up and pouncing on the mouse, it's, it's his. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Uh, the pagan gods, they do. And they do even worse. God's saying, who do you think I am? Am I some namby-pamby little runt like your pagan gods? No, he says, Offer thanksgiving as your sacrifice to God. We don't have the temple because we don't need it, guys. The altar has now become your heart. The altar has now become your conscience. So therefore, have a grateful heart. Live with thanksgiving to God. When you wake up in the morning, 
what should be the first thought that crosses your brain, even before anything passes your lips, it should be, thank you, God. When your feet hit the ground, you should say, ha, huh, they work. Thank you, God. It's raining out. It's cold. Thank you, God, that I get to even see this because I know I don't deserve it. Pay your vows to the Most High. Keep your word to Him. Lord, we will do everything you say. Turn the page and Moe's over here doing everything he's told not to do. Oh, wait a minute. That's funny. That's out of, that's what Israel did. No, that's what you and I do every stinking day. Pay your vows to the Most High and call on me when you are in trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. We're to be calling on the lover of our soul when we're in agony. We're to be calling on our God, Adonai El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one, when we're in need. We've been in need in this clinic because we are ridiculously busy and overbooked and I'm turning into a little white-haired garden gnome. And we've been praying. Well, God sent us someone. And she's, and I just had a conversation. She's going to be taking on more patience. Praise God! Oh, great, you can, you can, you can keep your load, Mo, and she can take on new, no, that's, no, no. I need to decrease in the clinic to a certain degree so that I can be focusing on preparing this. I just have to pay my bills. Which is why God gave me the clinic. Praise God. He's provided somebody. A sister in the Lord. Did we call on ZipRecruiter? Did we call on... No, we didn't. No. I've been praying to God for several years. Would you please raise somebody up to come and help? A believer. But to the wicked, God says, What right do you have to proclaim my laws or take my covenant on your lips when you so hate to receive instruction and fling my words behind you. That whole hyper grace crowd? Well, we want, we want, oh, I like this commandment and this commandment. Ooh, that adultery commandment. Let's get rid of that. We don't, we, we can function without that, can't we? Let's change the date on which we meet. All those those silly things about those antiquated commands about wearing the fringe on your no we don't need that guys God is searching he's looking through the whole world for someone who's going to take him at his word and take him seriously think about it when those of us that are married, when you were courting your spouse, were you looking for someone who would completely disregard everything you said? Who would just come to you and say, hey, I need 20 bucks now. Don't ask about what it's for, just give me 20 bucks. Hey, I want you to buy me that Cadillac sedan. Get it for me, would you? Hey, no, no, no. When we were courting the loves of our lives, we were courting them because they honored us, because they adored us. And we adored them, and we honored them. God is looking for people who adore Him and honor His Word. 
all of it. When you see a thief, you join up with him. You throw in your lot with the adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil. Well, I don't throw in with, with the thieves. Wait a minute. Who are you voting for? Who are you identifying within our society with? The people that rob life from babies? Unborn children? The people who rob a little old woman from her house because some idiot bureaucrat forgot to put a hyphen in her last name? No, that actually happens. I know the lady. Someone in Social Security messed up her name. They paid out for so many years and now they turned around and said, yeah, you owe us 80 grand and we want it now. Who's going to speak for these people? Our senators aren't. Who's going to speak for these people? Their children aren't. Their children are just hoping that they can get, get the old gal tucked away somewhere nicely into a home. It's evil. It's wicked. You don't have to be sitting with a ski mask on in the dark to be a robber and a thief. Ever meet insurance people? They rob and steal from a cubicle. dead horse there. You sit and speak against your kinsmen. You slander your own mother's son. When you do such things, should I stay silent? Remember, he's coming and he will not stay silent. Mm. You may have thought I was just like you, but I will rebuke and indict you to your face. He's not like us. He's not a ninny. He's a gentleman, but he's the original man. Remember, we're talking about the son of man. He's, he's not this little waif in a robe cooking fish sticks on a beach for his disciples. No, he is the king of kings. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to save you. Oh. And who's saying this? The judge. And in the Gospels, Yeshua said, He is the judge. But the reason people will want to argue with you about this is because they don't know Yeshua. They know the Western American Yeshua, the Gentile God made in our own image, who eats McDonald's, who goes to the ball games, fools around, does his party stuff, hangs out with the sinners, gets involved with the sinners, and on Sunday morning he's in church. But, you know, we don't want to get too pious. That's, that's the American Jesus. He's an idol. He's not the Yeshua I know. The reason they don't recognize him is because they never knew him in the first place. Whosoever, whoever offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice honors me. You want to honor God? You want to honor Yeshua? Offer thanksgiving as your sacrifice. Change your heart. And to him who goes the right way, what is the way? What is the right way? Torah. Torah is the way that he's speaking of. He who goes the right way, I will show the salvation of God. Hallelujah! 
and people say, oh, you're so legalistic. You don't understand grace because you're too legalistic. You guys have heard that, right? No, 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 no. I understand grace because I have a taste of what His commandments are. I have a taste of what the bar is, and I know I'm never going to reach it. Because I take my eyes off of it, and I lay down in this pile of filth, and I wallow in it. And then He gets me up, and He washes me. And He says, don't do that. Come on. Yom Kippur is not a once a year thing. It shows up on the calendar once a year. But we are preparing for the Yom Kippur. That's coming. And it's a lot closer than we realize. And we can debate about eschatology and we can debate about the things that have to happen or don't have to happen. Guys, regardless, it's coming. And it's very close. Uh, this current regime, we're, we're not going to get rid of them in the next election. We, they're stuck. We're stuck with them. They're going to clamp down. They're going to make it impossible for us to do things like this. And we will have to go underground. Praise he found us faithful enough to allow us to get a taste of what that's like. Praise God, because when that happens, look up. Yes, but when that happens, it's going to totally purify the body, isn't it? Those people for whom it's too inconvenient there's too much at risk. I could, I could risk going to jail. Then what would my standing in the community be? Listen, at that point, if you have a good standing in the community, something's wrong. I'm just saying. Don't consider it more important to please the men around you than to please God. So, Father... We are here tonight to worship you. And you've already blessed us with your word, which I'm amazed every time, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the grace that you have showered on us just in letting us be here. Father, for our sick that are not with us tonight, we ask you to be their healers. For those who are here that are exhausted and wrung out, Father, be their strength. For those that are watching that they just can't get here, Lord, for whatever reason. Father, you feed them. You speak to them. You encourage them. You're the lover of their soul. You do what you do so well. Love them, Father. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.